Jim Duke Radio Network. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. And these things that we're summoning into the world now are not demons, they're not evil, but they're more like the Lovecraftian great old ones. And we are, as a people, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Rational voice in the world of conspiracy. Information that goes beyond boundaries. This is the Jim Duke Perspective. Welcome to the Perspective. Tonight we're going to tackle the occult history of NASA. And we're going to bring this uh, to the esoteric um, focus on what NASA is about exposing uh, those that were involved and showing the possible deceptions that NASA has been involved with for whatever reasons. Now, we're going we're gonna to address it. My website is jimdukeperspective.com, and uh, that's where you can find all the information, the podcast archives, how to listen to the show, the articles that I have available, and videos I produce. And also how to connect with me, how to email and touch space on Twitter and Facebook. And I invite you to do so, keeping your comments civil, because I'm not going to entertain uh, rash uh, uh, accusations and, and uh, mocking, okay? I don't have to. <laughs> so if you're planning on doing that just to troll well, you're not invited. So, But if you really want to have discussion, even criticism, then, you know, we have a cordial discussion about it. We can go back and forth. My co-host, Bob Natupski, is with me, and we're going to take on this, this topic here. Bob, um, there was a video going on, and I don't know if I'm going to play it now. I think I'll wait for it but it questions Buzz Aldrin and what he says. A lot of people say that he's cynical lately and they don't take his words seriously because they say, oh, geez, he's just lost it. You know, those of his peers in in the um, in the scientific uh, arena and, and former astronauts, and I guess they're ready to send him off to, a, you, know, you know, a senior citizen home or something, but... Anyway, um, first, I just want to talk about NASA and the history of what it prescribes that it is. And, you know, what we what we hear about NASA is that it's a it's science and it's offering explanations to give an answer to the ultimate question. Are we alone in the universe? And to find the answers of our origin of life and collecting proof that there is a vast universe going beyond what, well, what even scriptures can tell us. And what we find is that science in this manner has always seemed to rival religion and the supernatural. It's offered as an alternative answer to the suspicions of a divine creator in order to contrast it with rational explanation and enlightenment of the age of reason and all that to suppress spiritual consideration. And uh, although, you know, the Rosicrucians and such that were masters of, of science and secret knowledge were also mystics considering themselves Christians. So, you know, that kind of crosses over, Bob. It's, it's strange how it kind of it, it it takes on both legs, but when you get into the Freemasons and the other uh, societies, like the Illuminati, they want to dismiss the supernatural and not regard the faith or what they call religion, and to make it totally scientific explanation, disregarding the divine principles of the Bible. But scriptures do not dismiss the workings of science. It actually lays in question the assumptions 
that are outside of fact that science has concluded, but it doesn't say that science isn't part of reality or life, you know? Yes, and it actually makes a distinction, Jim, between science and um, science falsely called or... Yeah, so-called science, yep. So uh, some of the science mimics the occult, and throughout history... All the world leaders had been interested in occult practices, wanting a secret knowledge for their advantage. Hitler did the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information out there on the internet. One of his castles, they had an occult ritual chamber while his staff was meeting above. So his so-called priests would do the rituals so they would get the power and the wisdom in the meeting. Okay. That's it. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't want to uh, to expound on that because well, it's getting interesting. Go ahead. I was okay. kind of hearing where you were going with it. So, uh whether it was um you know, for um IG Farben uh experimenting uh with pharmacology in the concentration camps or the Rockets, or the Messerschmitts, North Africa. Everything was done with the cult planning, with astrological forecasting, things like that. And even the United States planned D-Day on a bad astronomical day for Hitler. So these people who, in the name of science who get into what would be witchcraft, sorcery, and the like. You want to see a good example? Look at CERN. CERN mixes both together. And a lot of their top people are actual scientists, maybe even atheists, but a lot of them believe in Shiva or Apollo. It was specifically built on the ruins of an Apollo temple that supposedly has a chamber that would lead to the abyss spoken of in the Bible. So it's blended in, and it even hits us at home, Jim. How many times? Well, if I'm fortunate enough, if I'm lucky, bad luck, even when we sneeze, that's based in occult superstition, That if you're not blessed, you could die. So what do we automatically say? Bless you as part of, uh, oh, what's that thing you call it? Uh, uh, Those little superstitious uh, practices. Superstitious. I can't think of the other name. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. You know, like, you know, don't walk under a ladder. Don't let a black cat. It's called superstitions. Yep. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) Well, yeah. I'm trying to think of the Mennonite word for that. Oh, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. This, but yeah, the it it's this is based on ritual days, um, and we can connect it with the satanic sex rituals, and we will talk about that. Um, let's take a couple things that you said. First of all, I forgot to mention that uh, the tonight today is the anniversary of NASA, which is why I thought I'd bring this up. July 29th, 1958 is when the National Aeronautical Aeronautics and Space Act was passed, which is what NASA means, um, becoming operational on October 1st. And I believe the operational day is an occult holiday too. But it was, you mentioned the Nazi Germany scientists. Well, incidentally, uh, Werner von Braun carried over from Nazi Germany uh, under the SS uh, came over under our Operation Paperclip to assist in rocketry experiments after being director of the German V-2 rocket program. And he was considered the forerunner of the American space program. However, this is interesting, Bob, Werner von Braun himself denied that claim for himself because he gave honor 
to a young man named Jack Parsons, not himself, and considered him the true father of the American space program for his contribution to the development of solid rocket fuel. So let's take this from Jack Parsons' aspect because this will link Nazi Germany, the experiments, with what you were talking about, the satanic holidays. Jack Parsons co-founded a missile manufacturing lab and an advanced jet propulsion rocketry. So he started uh, the jet propulsion lab. Uh, Parsons was also interested in magic and the occult, and he became a member of the Ordo Templi Orientis, what we call, for abbreviation, the OTO. This OTO was Thelema-based, and it was... uh, the organization that Aleister Crowley took over. It's a fraternal religious sex magic order that Aleister Crowley kind of took leadership over. He was a British mystic known as the Great Beast 666 that he dubbed himself the Antichrist and the Beast and was considered the most evil man who ever lived, at least wanting to be dubbed as such. And Parsons' experimentation with rocketry was somehow tied with occult rituals, as you said, Bob, based on ancient pagan harvest festivals or celebrations for the dead. He tested his theories by launching experiments on Halloween in 1936. And then, you know, at the same time, his peers were considering his experiments to be fantasy of science fiction. But Parsons saw Crowley as a master mentor figure and idolized him. And he wrote of himself as the Antichrist loosed in the world. So he wanted to also be an Antichrist, pledging to carry out the word of the Beast 666 for Aleister Crowley. And he desired knowledge and esoteric sorcery He was steeped in occultism, Satanism, and black magic and swore the oath of the abyss and took the oath of the Magister Templi and also the oath of the Antichrist. And uh, he, uh, he partnered with a guy that many people would be familiar with named L. Ron Hubbard. The name sound familiar, Bob? Oh, yes. Yeah, it should. Because he was the founder of a system of hermetic metaphysical philosophy called Dianetics. And Dianetics was found, I guess uh, Hubbard got into some sexual trouble with people or some kind of uh, monetary trouble and different things that he was accused of. And I think he had a band that that Dianetics got banned, so he founded another philosophy, which was just a branch of it, called Scientology. But he and Parsons were partners in a ritual called Babylon Working of Aleister Ooh. Crowley. What? No, I, I just found something I didn't know. About Jack Parsons. Okay. He, uh, boy. He used to go to a church of Thelma on Winona Boulevard in Hollywood. Yeah, Thelma. This is from Wikipedia. Okay. Where he witnessed the performance of the Gnostic Mass. Yep. Celebrants of of the church had included Hollywood actor, of course, John Carradine. He played... Oh. Aaron Moses' brother in uh, The Ten Commandments by Cecil D. DeMille. And a gay rights activist named Harry Hay. And this was like between 1939 and 42. And um, uh, Thelma's founder Thelema. and, quote, you gotta say it right. head, It's the law of Thelema. Thel- 
Tholima. If you don't Tholima, say it right, you're going to be cast in utter darkness. I'm not using my magnifying glass. <laughs> okay. And actually, it wasn't <laughs> developed by Aleister Crowley. It was a magician before Aleister Crowley. And it was uh, influenced by John D. and um, Franklin, uh, uh, Franklin, actually Benjamin Franklin, and uh, right. uh, they knew about it, and uh, uh, Francis All right. Bacon. Okay, continue. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, it says uh, Parsons ca came to believe in the reality of the... Th Thelemic magic as a force that could be explained through quantum physics. Mm. He tried to interest his friends and acquaintances in uh, Thelema, taking s science fiction writers, you know, like well, Jack Williamson and Cleve Cartmill to the Gnostic Mass. So, he, this guy believed what we've been saying all along that he was into the occult, and we're saying that the occult tries to mimic with things like CERN or technology witchcraft. And he actually believed that science could do this, and so he was promoting both science and witchcraft to all his contemporaries. So yeah. he was more than a rocket designer. He was a missionary. <laughs> Exactly. We don't make this stuff up, Bob. Uh, this is actually being brought out. He was actually separate. They don't want to give tribute to him today because too many people understand and recognize his occult magic affiliation. And I don't know if you know this. There's a CBS special that uh, my friend BDK and Omega Frequency brought up uh, that they're they're actually filming a, a documentary on Jack Parsons or airing, I should say, because it's already filmed. And it's actually talking about his occult life because it can't hide it. It's in Wikipedia, <laughs> you know, um, but also what's in Wikipedia. And it talks about Babylon working. This was a ritual that he and L. Ron Hubbard were involved in that was uh, a ritual to summon the sex goddess of Babylon or uh, they, they named it something else. But it in. It was, uh, I believe, that his his uh, desire of rocketry, this is what I believe, was to send an obelisk, because that's what a missile or a rocket looks like, an obelisk, which is a male phallic symbol of, like, uh, uh, the, the phallic of, of Osiris in Egyptian, which is the male organ, and... I think that he was actually intending to send it, propel it into space like a sex ritual into the universe. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he thought of this as a high ritual that he could break through the firmament and it would simulate, this is my not my speculation now, simulate the phallic hitting or breaching the womb. It's quite possible, Bob. Uh, exactly. Or it could be, you know, whether you call him uh, Horus or uh, Osiris mm -hmm. or many other names. Supposedly he was cut up in his body. Yeah, that was Osiris. Sent and, all and his, over the place. And his son and Horus his, is resurrected. Yeah, and then somehow his mother wife yep. got all back, but what the phallic symbol represents. And the reuniting of this with him is supposed to bring him to life again. Right. Now, the idea of reaching the stars, uh, can I promote someone else's video? I don't know if it's a, content, if it's a competition, no. No. I'm oh, just, okay. Go ahead. I'm just kidding. Uh, that, that, I don't know. Okay. I, I, then I better not mention uh, Jason Cooley has an excellent video called Aliens and Ezekiel's Wheel. Oh, okay. And it, prom it shows you biblically what angels and stars and uh, UFOs are. Now, 
we did a podcast on it earlier and only touched upon it. Nothing, not as in depth as he did. Yeah, we're not as good as. So him. here's the thing, with the beliefs from Egypt, Babylon, Incas, Aztec, Mayas, Chaldeans, the stars were someone you would contact. Even the Greek actors and actresses, you know, they become stars. You know, they become spirits in the sky. They evolve to something better. So this effort on Jack Parsons or even on from Hollywood or musicians is to become a star, become godlike. It is actually the sin of the devil, and they're trying to use science, SRA, and different rituals in that um that Thelema was full of sex rituals, and that's why he married his second wife over that. Jack Parsons, that is. And I think it was. I think his second wasn't become, his. He stole. Didn't he steal, steal L. Ron Hubbard's wife or something? Had a sexual affair with her. Did I throw you off on that one? Oh, Bob, did I lose you? Where are you? That might have been his other wife. No, I was trying to read. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought you I lost was, you. This I, was I, his second wife. Okay, I was waiting for you to confirm that or deny it, but I thought yeah. there was something to so, that. Okay. Don't leave so me actually, hanging, Bob, when I'm like that and I speculate something. Yeah, they don't have information <laughs> on his first wife. Oh. Helen Parsons Smith. Yeah, she was involved in the ritual with him. Northrop. Well, this actually... This gets into what you're saying. Uh, well, first of all, I want to mention that Crowley uh, says it was the sheer force of Parsons and Hubbard's ritualism around there that opened the portal. Crowley actually recognized Parsons' contribution. And it was in 1949 that he took the oath for Antichrist. And he was also, did you know he was also instrumental in, in, um, in influencing the occult pentagram design of the Pentagon? That I did not know. Okay. I thought it was Lovecraft that had an influence on it. Well, it probably was, too. I could too. be mistaken. It could have been. It could have been both, but, you know, that's what it seems to be. But in 1950, listen to this. This kind of correlates what you just said. This confirms what you just said. You mentioned about um, the rituals, uh, the sex rituals. In 1950, Parsons was investigated by the FBI over the theft of rocket documents from the Hughes Aircraft Company. They discovered his connection to occult practices. The U.S. Air Force advised the FBI that the USAF had already collected files on Parsons and his relationship with Crowley, on which dated May 17, 1948, stated, it was a religious cult believed to act, uh, advocate sexual perversions organized at the subject's home. It was called a cult that was described as broadly hinted at free love. And there had been several complaints that strange going-ons were happening. Loud music and women uh, leaving naked and unnamed sources had described a church that's gathering a place of perverts. Furthermore, women of loose morals were involved running in and out. And st the story of Parsons' activities had become fairly knowledgeable, known amongst the scientists in the Pasadena area. Isn't that something? Yeah. That kind of confirms what you were saying and the involvement. Yeah, and it's interesting, um, that ritual. Babylon the, working? Uh, picture. Huh? Babylon working one? No, no, uh, the ritual at Area 57. <laughs> oh, okay, you got to tell me where you're going. Um, boy, I just forgot. <laughs> well, Roswell oh. happened during this when, time, uh, too. Yeah, yeah, Roswell, Area 57, Roswell. Yeah. I, I could remember Area 57, but not Roswell. Yeah. Now, That's the Alistair portal that Crowley, Alistair Crowley seemed to think that opened up. Yeah, drew a picture of a little gray man. Yeah, Lam. Or a little gray man. Lam. Yeah, Lam or Lamb. Lamb, yeah. Which could be 
like a false lamb. Uh, and fallen angelic substitute for Christ, given wisdom or something, you know? Yeah, it was... Well, anyways, that's it, another it was, subject. Well, it was there. a picture of... He actually... What people... Uh, let me explain that it, it's it it was a channel that uh, Crowley, um, it, it was an entity that Crowley channeled, and he believed it was a spirit ent- entity called Lamb, but it was a it, it could have been described as an alien force. And if you look at it, it's a it's what people would describe in the abductions and close encounters and such as the big head, gray headed, uh, big eyed creatures, and that's what the picture was that Crowley used. And it's incidental that that's described as aliens, even though Crowley believed he was, he was summoning a demon or channeling a demon and people don't put two and two together and realize that the aliens are actually demonic entities, whether transformed to physical bodies through DNA or whatever, or whether they are spiritual entities. It's interesting how, you channel them just like Crowley did with the the spirits and just like people do with spirits and necromancing and such, summoning um, spirits of the dead. And the the aliens that people had connection with, eventually they claim that they don't even have to be there in their presence. They can telepathically unite with them and channel them. Wow, that sounds like demonic spiritism rather than it does alien abductions or alien close encounters. But that's why this stuff is so close, closely tied. And it's ironic that Roswell happened in 1947 in the same year later on that, that Crowley died. And uh, some think that he managed through these rituals with Parsons help to open up a portal, which is why they were seeing all sorts of lights in the sky and alien, uh, well, they didn't know it was UFOs. They it was an alien. It was UFOs unidentified because they don't know what they are, even if they aren't ex- extraterrestrial uh, beings from from the planet uh, Plutonia or whatever it is, uh, and Palladia or whatever. Uh, it it's still unidentified, but the lights in the sky are like angelic lights, and you know it does say in Scripture, Second Corinthians um, eleven, that. It's is it so much that Satan can masquerade as an angel of light because his ministers as angels of righteousness, looking to deceive. Their end is to basically um, deceive, and these entities definitely have deceived man into thinking something else is out there. And this ties into the NASA explorations of why they would want to go out there and explore. Now I find something interesting. And I cannot find a connection between the two Parsons. I wanted to see if Alan Parsons was an offspring. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because of the things he said. But it says his parents were like a Denny Parsons and then uh, I forget his mother's name. You know, a lot of times that stuff is masked. Like It could be. Now, it could be. Or it could be a distant relative or something. A picture. Of Alan Parsons, um, not from his early days, but eh, a little bit into his career, and his face rounded out a little. He looked like Jack Parsons' son. Don't say he looked like Aleister Crowley. No, he, oh, no, that's uh, Barbara uh, Bush. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyways, um, so here's a. And matter of fact, Rockefeller did and Soros a little when they got Ooh, older. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to go there. Okay. <laughs> well, anyways, the the stuff, you know, like the eye in the sky, I can read your mind. Yep. And Alan Parsons wrote and sang a lot about the same things Jack Parsons believed in. Oh, and yeah. Okay. The more you're talking about these different rituals and the things, uh, Could be a coincidence with the last name. I don't know. It's speculation. But if you, you know, if our audience looks at the two pictures, you know, some will say, yeah, he does. Some might say, no, he doesn't. But I just find it fascinating. Well, no, you know, it's a valid 
um, reaching point. <laughs> Everything, a lot of things we do. You know, I got, Bob, we got some people that say we're like rambling um, idiots, but they come to realize that we have a lot of information that we share, so they've grown to us. We have other people that say we're just morons and idiots, um, taking speculation to a point of of, of really reaching. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes I agree with them, you know, but that's not, you know, we're having fun here. We're talking about these issues. You're making a, a point, though, and it's incidental that a lot of people with similar names of people that are uh, uh, in other fields involved in the same thing tend to take on the same attributes and it's just ironic how a parsons takes on jack parsons uh, philosophies and such and puts him into songs it's not unlike that the spirits use the same names as a connecting point but it's also possible like you mentioned bob that they they are some kind of illicit uh some, some kind of illicit relations with the other person so you know you never know but regardless the the same spirit works through both entities and alan parsons with his new age abstract philosophies in his songs you know eye in the sky and then you can relate that to osiris possibly or the eye of horus and you know these they you find that they're at least at the very least bob they're connected, believe it or not, with the OTO. And that's All right. really strange how the music industry is uh, controlled by members of the agency of the OTO that either draft recruits for the Illuminati or that control the music industry of where it's going. So you're not off track totally reaching. Unless somebody wants to call us out and say we are, then I guess their perception well, yeah. is different of us, which they're not going well, like to like us re- anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, well, what we try to do, people, we give you what is fact, we give you what is biblical, and then we sometimes we journey. give you <laughs> yeah. our <laughs> our speculation. Yeah. And, uh Oh boy, my train of thought. Too. Okay, yeah. When we speculate, we say we speculate. Yeah. So the stuff is interesting. It's good to know. Sometimes it's good to speculate. You know, stimulate the thinking. Uh, you get talking. You put different pieces of the puzzle together. But bottom line is, you know, when people start getting do- dogmatic and making an issue of salvation, and then it causes division. You know, it's never meant to do that. Right. It's to make people think, show them what's going on, and if possible, bring them closer to Christ Jesus or to know him. Now, you mentioned the names, Mm -hmm. and I went to Webster's 1828 Dictionary and found out a definition of parson. Oh, (laughs) really? The priest, yes. Okay. The priest of a parish or ecclesiastical society, semicolon, the rector or incumbent of a parish— who has a patriarch parochial, sorry, parochial charge like parochial school or cure of souls. It is used in this sense by all denominations of Christians, but among independents or congregationalists, it is uh, merely a colloquial word. And the second definition, a clergyman or a man that is in orders or has been licensed to preach. Now, if you think about it, the Parsons rule over parishioners. Kind of sounds like those who will perish. So it sounds like, you know, originally, a parson had a parish or an ecclesiastical society, and then it became a Christian term. Oh, yeah? What was the Christian term? Well, parson. You know, like in England, they have a parson for a preacher or something. Oh, okay. Parsonage, like? Yeah, like that's where we get a parson from. We we more or less call them pastors. But, um, you know, parson was like an ecclesiastical society leader. 
for oh, an okay. incumbent of a parish. Oh. So at that time, a parish and a church were two different things. Church is a called out assembly, but we kind of get that from the Greek word kirka, like Captain Kirk, but mm-hmm. that's a whole nother podcast. Yeah. See what happens when I give you um, uh, narrative leeway? We go all different directions. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a little different today. It's more of a discussion. We start off with a topic and expound. Yeah. Now, NASA was founded on a uh, similar satanic worshiping of occults and black magicians. Um, and it, it was it's classified by some as a military Hollywood pseudoscience cartel. And it's surrounded by mystic organizations. And um, so the, the NASA has involvement with societies like Freemasonry and such. And the true aim, well, let's say this. the One of the external aims is to have an excuse of taxpayer funding to promote and profit by developing and deploying pseudoscience technology and methodology through the name of science exploration as well as funding black op programs. And it's likely that the founding employees are members of other societies like Freemasons, as were the astronauts, and possibly members of several offshoot spiritual esoteric groups, I suspect as the OTO and the Golden Dawn, which like Maurice um, Strong of the United Nations and... uh, uh, who's that other guy before him, the, the director, uh, Robert Mueller, Mueller were um, both members of the Golden Dawn and other secret societies of Aleister Crowley involved in our governments. And that's the United Nations. Imagine, you know, our governments, our military, high-ranking members of our military leaders, a lot of them are Freemasons. And let me just read uh, yeah. a quote here. It says, uh, this is... From the Meaning of Masonry in the Forward by Dr. Alan Boudreau, uh, Boudreau, and he says, In this new Aquarian age, Freemasonry may well be the vehicle enabling us to enter that inner chamber where we can join the true initiates and share experiences now veiled from all but a handful of brethren. So these, you know, these external agencies are often external you know excuses for science that are covering up esoteric methods and we wonder yes. what the purpose would be yeah we got to remember wasn't Mueller also um uh part of theosophy yes absolutely yep he had, yeah and so uh some of the people who influenced parsons so is Maurice. We're followers Strong. of theosophy, mm-hmm. which uh, Hitler always kept a copy of um, Helena Blavatsky's book yep. with him wherever he went. Mm-hmm. He had to have that. And he met with uh, Von Brunner. Von Brunner ties into Parsons. Parsons into Crowley and to John Carradine and Crowley ties into what is it? L Ron Hubbard and Lovecraft. And I think HG Wells. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yep. And then if you take Crowley further ties in with the rock band, black Sabbath, he ties in with the Beatles he was on the inside cover back in the days of albums. Well, on Crowley the was Hotel yeah, California. Crowley was associated with the song "Mr. Crowley" by Ozzy. That was after Black Sabbath. It wasn't really Black Sabbath. Oh yeah, that's right. It was after Black Sabbath. I always forget that. Yeah, but we'll be so corrected actually, if we don't mention that. Yeah, influenced the Eagles, the Beatles, oh yeah, many other bands, yeah. many actors and actresses. So Parsons was tied to Hollywood. Crawley's tied to Hollywood. And then there's also the Church of Satan there, which I think now um, 
Lanton LaVey passed, but I think Jim Carrey now is a high priest. Yeah, that's what they say, yeah. And then, so you have, like, acting, the music industry, and, of course, Crawley had positions in the U.S. and the British government, and he was allowed to freely travel and do things, even though he was a known child molester for sex rituals. Let's go yeah, there. he was paid by two governments. Yeah. Okay, well, hang on. Yeah. So, you know, this rocket science, you know, people say, hey, well, this isn't rocket science. <laughs> well, think about it. This rocket science ties into the occult. It ties into Hollywood. It ties into movies. It ties into governments. With all these ties, there has to be another ju- agenda. Now, you wanted to explore Crowley? What's that? Are you asking You wanted me? to yeah, explore his... Uh, no, I don't. Sexual... Mo- oh, is that all right? I wanted to go with the Hollywood thing. Cause you're, oh, okay. Because you're, you're, you're going there. So let's make that okay. connection. There is a connection well, that ex- yeah. exists between Hollywood and NASA, like you mentioned. Hollywood... Um, notice that Hollywood and Disney... Un- un- well, Hollywood mainly, unleashed endless genres of science fiction films and it indoctrinated citizens to be desensitized to the or interested in space and what's beyond it did you want to mention something or okay so when that no i just didn't know if you were saying something and... that i can't think of the name that the church i called thelma by mistake the lima thelmatic thelemic yeah or Thelema. So that church was based in sex rituals for knowledge and power and stuff. Aleister Crowley was into sex rituals for that. And then Hollywood and Disney. Well, Disney was into the SRA child sex rituals. Hollywood's into the sex rituals. For what? Receiving demons for the abilities to perform. So... Whether it's rocketry, Hollywood, or music, people are trying to contact these spirits, these extraterrestrials, whatever you want to call them, out there in space for knowledge, power, talent, ability. And yet in school they teach you, well, all these ancient civilizations did that. Yet it's prevalent in the world today in our biggest money-making industries in our, in our most so-called civil governments. It it's all ties in. All right. So, And you're right with those movies. Mm-hmm. Like that Star Trek Voyager. Mm-hmm. That whole series was based on getting us to accept artificial intelligence. That it was actually intelligent. A living being could grow, could think, expand its horizons and teach us to talk to it for guidance. So that now they're showing other forms of artificial intelligence through Hollywood, promoting you know science fiction, rocket technology, and on even a purely occult shows. But now they got these people tied into their little cell phones, which the first ones were the Star Trek communicators. So... Now we're used to talking things. Now you have like Siri on Apple. Uh, Google has something that will speak to you. Samsung does. Even Windows 8 has a speaking assistant. And these are supposed to be learning technologies. We're getting used to talk to something. And that's not human. Answer it. Ask questions. So if we go and you have a kid and it's like, you ask your device, hey, my baby won't stop crying. It might say, check the diapers, feed it, take the temperature, all these different things, give an advice. Next thing you know, you start to trust it. Well, the internet was started by CERN. So everything we do in this new communication goes right back to CERN where they're trying to use D-Wave computers, and they're actually transmitting data through a portal and getting some answers back. 
So this artificial technology may be able to grow in advance because it's actually technology connecting with the demons, which is exactly what uh, Jack Parsons uh, talked about, you know, using uh, science to perform witchcraft. Okay. You done? Sorry, I threw a lot at you. <laughs> I just I wanted to go with the Hollywood thing because you were on that, and I do have some notes here about. Um, yes, I forgot to bring it back around. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, um, so so yeah. So Hollywood is used to stage the propaganda that's involved to subject our mind and do what else, Bob? To alter our consciousness about yep. things. What is the definition of altering consciousness from? It's actually the definition of magic. So it's actually a form of crafting, uh, casting a spell. Um, the, the Bible says in Daniel 8.24, his power shall be mighty, talking about the Antichrist, talking about the devil. His power shall be mighty, uh, verse 25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And that craft means deceitfulness of witchcraft and such. Um, so it's used as propaganda. Now, why would they purpose NASA to be a propaganda? Why do they have to subject us to uh, uh, space exploration? What purpose would it cause? Well, we have to first ask if it was a hoax in the first place, because you know, ask if we ever went to the moon. I want to play something, Bob, uh, of the of how powerful the indoctrination is that has been subjected over people to see the moon. Like, think about the moon footage that we saw back when in the 60s. Uh, some of us were very young. Uh, some of us weren't even born who are listening. But, and I know you were, and I don't know if you watched it, but, you know, you remember the film, the pictures. They were very, very um, archaic. They were grainy. They were hard to make out details and very quick. And there was like not a lot of footage. But listen to this interview. If I can get it up, I'm going to try it. I got a new computer, so I'm working out the quirks still. I want to play this clip. This is a six year old girl asking Buzz Aldridge a question about why we haven't gone back to space. But listen to what he says in the answer. Okay, ready? Let's see if we can play this. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and and that's the way it happened. And and if it didn't happen, it's nice to know why it didn't happen. So in the future, if we want to keep doing something, we need to know why something stopped in the past that we wanted to keep it going. But I think I know. What did he He said, she asked, why haven't we gone back to the moon? And he answered, well, because we hadn't actually gone there. <laughs> and people are trying to twist this and saying he meant we haven't gone there again and again. But he said, you know, people want to know. And he says they want to know why we're, you know, keeping it going. What he's probably talking about is a lie that we went there. But regardless, here's the point I want to make with staying on this, Bob, with the connection with Hollywood. It was claimed. Do you know that this you probably know this, Bob, and correct me if if you do, that the military departments in the military have its own film crew propaganda. It has a large scale film scenery uh, stage and sound stages. And regardless you know that? Yes, and you guess guess who was in charge of that? Disney? 
No, no, a man born in my hometown, Theodore Giesel. Really? Oh, he was involved in that? Dr. Seuss. Yeah. He did the war propaganda films. I know he was involved in in the uh, cartooning and stuff. I didn't know he was involved in... I know he was involved in propaganda, but I didn't know he was involved in all that. I have seen Mulberry Street. Hmm. Funny and, how Dr. Seuss and Timothy Leary... We're have born you in seen, the same city. Have you seen Whoville? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so the simulations, they rehearse, I, I, from what I understand, they rehearsed the simulation of space exploration in a soundstage and filmed it at the Atomic Energy Commission's top secret test site in the Nevada desert. And it was guarded, a guarded soundstage that Disney was in control of supposedly and maybe von braun was a part of it uh, and and um maybe theodore geisel was but it was a huge scale mock-up of the moon using the yeah. desert and some say that was the filming because they actually couldn't film the moon but here's the thing bob that besides the footage of the broadcasts at the time that were broadcast on the news all the official original official photos of the Apollo flight and the film has been lost and the footage accidentally erased with all its telemetry data. Whoops. What a big mistake. Where are the film footage proving NASA landed on the moon? Well, we don't have any. We accidentally taped over it like a wedding video. Unbelievable. And incidentally, Hollywood and Disney, listen to this, Bob, has never attempted, had not attempted at, at, the, at the time to produce a movie about the moon landing or showing a moon scene from space. Why not? Because Hollywood is too close to what was actually filmed. And it's said that the film is actually a, a hoax. It, it's actually not on the moon. It's in the desert, and it's in a soundstage, proving it by certain um, um, in, in, in discrepancies in the film. If you look at it carefully, like shadows in the wrong spot, lights. How do they put? In, how do they put shadows of lights all around like a stage if the sun is being its light? Plus, they said the imagery wasn't that great, so they had to simulate some of it even the pictures of the moon and, and earth were said to be artistically uh altered in order to make them more visible and but right. there, there's no films at that time that were saying hey let's make a film about this because they couldn't do it if they did it people would it would have let on that it was all staged in the first place and you know well, did uh, you hear about the golf ball Oh, I heard something about that. Go, say, tell, tell me. Well, in a no-atmosphere environment, there would be no curve to it. You know, left to right, you know, the hook. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if the moon's gravity is one-sixth, that was just an average swing and distance a ball would travel on Earth. Now, in addition to being filmed out there in the desert, there's some evidence pointing to Stanley Kubrick producing right. that. Yeah. They say that was and, a hoax. Yeah. Like in Wag the a Dog. A lot of people that came out and said that he was involved. Yeah. Well, that movie Wag the Dog, you know, uh, they hired a Hollywood producer to stage a, an event mm -hmm. to keep people from finding out. I think it was a vice president molesting a child or something like that. Mm hmm. Well, anyways, in the end, the producer wanted the credit, so the government suicided him <laughs> or something like that. Wow. You know, gave him a heart attack. But um, supposedly, you know, some sources, I don't know how true they were, speculate that Stanley Kubrick was suicided by the government because he wanted recognition now uh, for the whole moon event. 
Right. He but was now we're talking high school. Yeah. They didn't put do him remember, in the credits they, of the of the NASA footage. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you remember in high school uh, when they teach you, you know, about astronomy and science? Um, I, 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 I fell asleep in most of my classes, so don't go. There. Okay. Well, basically, they teach us that the ozone protects us from the sun's radiation. And if it wasn't for that, we'd be, uh, you know, fried within a short period of time. And uh, the, the, you know, the, on a small scale, it's our sun, sunburns we get, the blisters, things like that. But after you leave the ozone, there's a problem with radiation, and that's why we can't travel through space, because we have no atmosphere or ozone to deflect it. And then they teach you we went through that to the moon. So, some, so how do we get through the radiation barrier they teach us? How they, how they have the radiation shielding? I failed. I told you. I fell asleep. No, no, that, I mean, if you, well, if, this is for the audience, not for you. <laughs> okay. Well, I got to learn too. If you happen to remember being taught these two different things in high school, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, they taught us two different things. After you leave the Earth's atmosphere, we can't travel in space because of the radiation. Right. Yet somehow we made several trips to the moon. And no telescope can really find anything on the moon. Try going to any um, major university with a powerful telescope. Say, hey, show us a flag. Show us a lunar rover. You can see... Um, you can see... No, forget it. I'm not going to... Um, anyway... Um... <laughs> The, yeah, and it's incons there's inconsistencies um, from the footage of the newscast that were retained that leave question to the shadows, the light, wind on the flag, and the walking patterns of the universe uh, of the astronauts. I saw uh, a documentary um, just today, actually, as I was uh, looking for some uh, information to to you know bring to the to the show, and um, I saw. Bob, you know you know the pictures of the of the astronauts uh hobbling across the surface of the moon and how it's like slow motion because there's yep. no gravity. Well they said let's let's speed this up a little bit like a normal speed. And I, Bob, it looks like in full speed it looks like people naturally walking on the ground. It doesn't even look like like with the slow motion it looks like they're floating a little bit. And they slowed it down. It looked like they were just like walking quickly and hopping across the surface, and and that's what they did. They slowed down the film. That's what yeah. it looks like. I mean, and and the, and the pictures of the Earth have been altered. They showed one film that didn't get released at the time that later got released, and it shows alterations made to the Earth that the Earth was not round, but it was. Like ob uh, obelisk, like or an obelisk, um, disc dome. Yeah, no, it was a uh, what's it called? Oblong. Like it was, it wasn't a circle, and it it it's it said that it was possibly um, viewed through like a lens, and 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 uh, uh, like sh the shadows were made to look like the space because there's no, there's not even any light of 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 stars now when you see stars if well, you look at the astronauts pictures there's no stars in the background of the original um uh footage uh, you know what we still have from the newscast uh, of anybody seeing stars and they even asked neil armstrong do you remember seeing stars out there and he goes oh yes i'm sure we viewed stars and they said, well, what did they look like? You were actually closer to the universe than we are here. And he couldn't comment. He says, I don't remember. Oh, I forgot, you know. Uh, it wasn't a big deal to him. Why didn't they get pictures of that? That's what they should have shown. But there, when you see the footage, there's no stars in the atmosphere because it would have blown the cover when somebody realizes that they don't match up to what they should have looked like. And... These are, you know, I, I'm just saying to the people out there that 
whether you believe we landed on the moon or not, there's a lot of fabrications of the footage that we got that prove that it had it has been altered and and not the true um, pictures of, of of the moon landing that these may be the fabricated uh, staged events um, to give us something. But whether you believe it really happened or not, you have to admit there's something funny about the images that we received. So you got anything to sum it up before we go to the next section? Uh, don't tell anybody. I read the book of Enoch. Uh-oh. <laughs> no. Which one? The magic one of Enoch 3? No, no, or no, the, the first, first one? one. Oh, okay. That's the better now, one. Now, in there, Enoch had seen portals or windows in which the spirits could pass through from the heavens. And I believe it's in uh, Malachi, you know, the tithe chapter. Well, I'm not going to touch the tithe. But uh, I believe it's one of the prophecy books. God talks about opening up a window of blessings. I think it's in Malachi so, 3. Biblically, yeah, I think it's in Malachi 3. But uh, I'm getting, well, the tithe will be another show. But So to God, a window would be a portal. Now, interesting how our computers are run on windows. Or uh, some of the uh, mystic, that was the word I was looking for, the mystic belief or uh, superstition when someone passes away, you open a window so their soul can go. And a lot of these uh, computers, even the calculators, were developed for for NASA. So their ties are actually to reach the occult. You know, maybe physically go to Lamb that Alistair Crowley met with, that rather than have Lamb come to them. Or maybe they can contact other ones. You know, there's people who believe they've been transported to Mars and Venus or even Saturn. Saturn could be the uh, prison planet or even uh, to Nibiru. So this is all tied into the occult to make us believe something different. So now you got stuff from NASA saying they did go, but you have science proving it's kind of impossible. You know, there is a slight chance they found some way to block the radiation and they could have gone. <laughs> and it's secret technology. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I'm sorry. Now, did you want to oh, move on to the next topic? Because All right. Well, I, I, I'm going to go here and I'm going to send a disclaimer out before I go here. Now, anybody, folks, this is not an open invitation to attack us or attack me primarily. This is not an open invitation to make a platform for this one pet peeve topic. And this is not to say that um, this is used to prove as the measure of whether you have faith or salvation because it's a matter of truth and the truth shall set you free. Therefore, if you don't believe this, you are not set free and you are going to hell. This is not that point. But I do want to make a mention. Why would the NASA be interested in showing us a global, a globe world, Earth, proven by exploration in space? Is NASA lying to us? If they're lying to us about exploration and about landing on the moon, could they be lying to us about the shape of the Earth? I'm only bringing this out for the point because I, I've got numerous people saying, why don't you address flat Earth? And the reason I don't address it primarily is not because I don't believe in it, even though I am still weighing out scriptures because scriptures are the primary source of my belief. Um, and I, it hasn't been substantiated whether that's what God's speaking of, even though he talks about 
ends of the earth, and he talks about um, north and south as the north is from the south. That would indicate edges. However, if that was true, I want you to consider this, the earth would not be a sphere as far as a disk round. It may be a cube or square in order to have four corners. So we cannot take everything primarily um, literal as literal goes. But I'm not going to question flat earth believers. But I'm also not going to make it a rhetoric of doctrine that if you don't believe, you're going to hell. So I'm, I'm only bringing up the point to say NASA could be lying to us, okay? That's the point I want to make. And um, it's a it's about the lying, not about whether you believe in flat earth and are going to hell or you believe the truth or not. I want to make that clear. However, the questions remain. Is NASA indoctrinating a fabrication to hide these facts? And in order to basically dis attempt to discredit the Bible's accounts. Because in the first place, NASA does not give a tribute to God. It gets it gives a tribute to mankind. One giant step for man, or one step for mankind, or one step for man, one giant step for mankind. And the Bible says, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So therefore, the stars and the firmament and the the uh, atmosphere show God's handiwork as it all works together in our life-sustaining. And NASA would like nothing more than to discredit God and not give him, the creator, the tribute. Um so I think that this would be what gives the NASA and other um, scientists the, the room to try to discredit using science if they can say, hey, look how more vast the, the atmosphere is, the, envir- the universe is. God lied. There's no firmament. So it can be an aspect of truth. But that's not the truth that Jesus says will set you free, whether you know the shape of the earth. I want to make that clear. The truth he was talking about was the truth of your relationship with God, the truth of how sin is reacting and consequential, and how salvation is in him as the truth, the way to truth, the life, not the way, the truth of the flat earth and the life. you got to make that differentiation, folks, or I can't talk to you rationally, okay? Even if you want to bring up the shape of the earth. Don't make that a salvation issue. But NASA is a tool of the cabal, I believe, to disconnect people from understanding their own consciousness uh, and altering it, which is the definition of magic, and its true power and significance in Jesus Christ. It's to deceive using magic and ritual masked as science and making our lives just like evolution is. Evolution's the same thing, folks. You know, we can prove God created to his kind by seeing those scriptures in in the Bible. But if someone says, well, I'm not sure about the Big Bang and all that, that's not going to send them to hell. It's not an essential argument over whether someone believes in the truth of salvation. So I want to clarify that. But uh, NASA's experiment and science's um, contribution is a lot of times to try to prove something other than creation in the Bible. But it makes our lives, if they can put a a subjective suspicion in our heart, it makes our lives inconsist, uh, insignificant as a speck of dust in a vast universe, making us accidentally spontaneous eruption caught up in a spinning round planet. You see what I mean? So it could be a distraction and a deviation away from the truth of what, how God uh, created us. However, I don't believe the shape of the earth is really going to have that much significance to our existence, just our matter of perception of the, of, of the truth of, of God's word. So we have to differentiate there, right? Yep. Is that clear? Well, I there's... hope it's clear enough. Yep. 
Okay. See, there's some interesting arguments for whether it's round or flat. Now, here's things that people for, forget to mention. Biblically, the earth was created before the sun, the moon, and the stars, which is kind of interesting. So the Bible promotes a geocentric earth where everything revolves around the earth, not the earth around the sun. Mm. Now, back when I was in school, all the teachers and all the books were dogmatic that Galileo proved the earth was round. Yet, I guess back as, as far as Pythagoras, around maybe 300 B.C., speculated it might be round. Well, here's the thing. We have questions on creation, whether the earth is round or flat. You know, uh, well, God created the things, no big bang, but that's... Uh, so here's a th thing. We know what the Bible says is true. Now, it'd be interesting to prove one way or another whether the earth is round or flat. Um, for example, if the earth is a spinning ball, if you take a bucket and you put some water in it and you spin it around and round and round as kids do to show that you can keep the water in the bucket without spilling it, there's a centrifugal force. So if we're spinning, how come we have tidal waves coming on two different continents, on an east one and on a west one? Water will naturally flow in the same direction of spin. Now they say, well, gravity will overcome that. And that's why that would happen. And you can get it going in both directions. So say that's true. Then how come if you take a plane from New York City to fly to London, England, you fly for eight hours? Now the Earth, it takes just 24 hours in a day. So that eight-hour flight, you are traveling one-third of the Earth's circumference. At the same time, the Earth is moving away from you. So in that eight hours, if the Earth was spinning away, you would have covered two-thirds of the distance of the Earth in one flight. Now, the, England's moving away as you fly from New York. When you fly from London back to New York City, the Earth is coming towards you. So it doesn't take half the time. It should take four hours. It's the same eight hours. Now, no one has ever flown over the South Pole. We've had uh, expeditions race for the North Pole. We've had planes fly under it, ships sail underneath it, and all that. How come Hitler was so interested in it? How come the mountains described in the Book of Enoch matched mountains in Antarctica? How come a direct flight from uh, the tip of South America going over to the tip of Africa, shortest direction would be over the South Pole. How come they have to come up towards Europe and then go all the way back down a greater distance? How come planes do not fly in what we call the Southern Hemisphere? And another interesting question is, why does the UN use a flat Earth for their symbol? There's a lot of unanswered questions out there. Yeah, that is true. Now, it'd be interesting to know these things and other topics we talk about, whether it's witchcraft, rocketry, or whatever. But sometimes these things are a diversion to keep people from thinking about things and to actually keep them away from knowing Christ Jesus. So you put things in the shape of the earth and all that, then they can use it to say, okay, so this is wrong in the Bible, or that's wrong, or the other thing. And some people will actually hide behind these things or push their beliefs on there because they don't want to confront their own relationship uh, between themselves and the Lord God himself. 
So it's easy to get caught up in these things and it's good to learn them, but it's also good to use what you learn or what you research in the proper fashion. Acts 17.11 has a very interesting verse. Um, it mentions that the Bereans studied the things that Paul told them daily to see if they were true. God called them noble, more noble than those in Thessalonica to be specific. So the Bereans questioned Paul. If Paul was here today, what church would question him? Paul could come in and he could say the earth is a pyramid and everybody would believe it. They would not study the scriptures to see if those things were true. So, uh, you know, it's up to us, you know, to look into these things ourselves, compare them to the scriptures, whether it's stuff we talk about on the podcast or it's stuff you hear from your local pulpit. Uh, we all have a, it's our own responsibility to learn about Christ himself, ourselves rather. Okay. And if, if you're Does that good, make sense? Yeah. yeah. And I just want to say that I think that a lot of this stuff, evolution and in my, in my perspective, even tribulation, uh, rapture, uh, and, Earth, the the uh, shape of the earth and evolution are all like Jewish using Rosicrucian mysticism and science that has altered world philosophies and contaminated with science to try to put question to the biblical accounts and make people subject to the worldly masters who are the elite who are actually subject to to their master, Lucifer, making us subject to the New World Order, which I believe is the goal of the Jesuits as well as the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians that are actually, Rosicrucians are involved in theosophy. Theosophy was, uh, Adam Blavatsky was actually a Rosicrucian as well. So I think these tie-in links with the world philosophies and uh, and the world counterfeits against the gospel of Christ to sway us away from the things of importance of Christ. So I, I, I do think that these things have to do with uh, trying to persuade men away from the gospel and away from the truth of Jesus Christ, whether it's, you know, the shape of the earth or whether it's the philosophies or whether it's the deception of whether, you know, government is in control or whether, you know, science overrides scripture. All these things are to basically put in doubts to God and his word. And in reality, they're the things that set you free. They're the things that give you the hope. He, the scriptures tell of him who gives you the hope Jesus Christ, that God has used to redeem man for their sins that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him and confesses him as Lord and Savior will not perish, but they'll be saved and have everlasting life. Not be ashamed of him, and he will not be shamed of you. And therefore, that's really your only counter against all these attacks against you, against humanity, and against God. Even though God is not taken by their antics because he overall is in control. And um, do you have one more thing, Bob, before we close? Yes. uh, You know what? This about, you know, diverting us from God is true, but there's one other major point, whether it's Kabbalah, uh, Freemasonry, OTO, witchcraft, uh, all these different mysteries, flat earth, this rocket stuff, it's all to keep mystery Babylon hidden. All the Freemasonry, Jesuits, Catholicism, it's all part of Mystery Babylon. That's why it's called Mystery Babylon. So it's out there to deceive us because Mystery Babylon is the mother of all harlots and abominations. That's from witchcraft to 
murder to child molestation to if it's sin it comes from mystery mystery babylon is the mother of it all right and with that my website is jimdukeperspective.com and go there and touch base and that's how you can connect with me and find the podcast archives and how to listen to the show thank you for listening we will see you next time